we're in an armed conflict here, but my orders are to deploy to Iraq and as advise and assist the Kurdish Peshmerga who are at war with ISIS. And this is the man in charge of Canada's special forces, Major General Mike Rouleau. What does an ISIS enemy look like? What is ISIS? Um, from my perspective, we're dealing with, uh, it's, a very, it's a very fanatical group of people. I mean, the things that they do to people that they capture are almost incomprehensible to people like us that come from the West. But they're very adaptive and they're a learning organization. And so we as military people are very careful not to underestimate their capabilities. Who's winning right now? Who's got the upper hand? Militarily, I would say that when I got here two years ago, um, ISIL had the initiative. They were very, very close to the Kurdish flot. Now I come here and I see that we have put space between us and them. We are hurting ISIL in this part of the world. Uh, and that has forced them to adapt how they work, how they operate. If that's what winning looks like this week, I'll take it. The front is all along this side. This is the front line with ISIS. On this side, Canadian Special Forces soldiers and their Kurdish allies, the Peshmerga Army. A kilometer away, you can't see them, but they're out there, fighters of the Islamic State. The biggest threat right now being indirect fire. This bridge, the key link to Mosul, was blown up by ISIS as they retreated. This is the bridge. ISIS had control of this entire area up until the uh, Peshmerga forces pushed them right out of here. Okay, so their last uh, last effort was uh, demoing the bridge in order to stop the counterattack as much as they could. And beyond it, a no man's land, seeded with mines under constant fire. You'll notice uh, in the low ground over there, that's Hassan Shami. Okay, so you can see the proximity of it. Hassan Shami gets hit on a daily basis by what we call Katusha rockets. The blown up bridge is surrounded by abandoned villages riddled with ISIS booby traps. This is uh, basically a classic irregular warfare mission. In the military we use the term IW and it's really getting with an indigenous force and achieving policy objectives by, with and through that indigenous force. And then special forces are very, very used to working in austere environments in a very distributed way. So I have very small numbers of troops that cover down on a very large area of frontage here. With coalition support, the Peshmerga are holding a front line more than 300 kilometers long. In December 2015, ISIS staged this deadly attack, nearly breaking through, until the Canadian forces were called in to help the Peshmerga push back the attackers. What started as a small team of 69 Special Forces soldiers here in Iraq has now been tripled, fulfilling Canada's ground troop promise made when we pulled our fighter jets from the air. Now, for the first time, Canada's most elite soldiers are coming out of the shadows to speak freely about this mission with only one restriction, no names. It's such a privilege for us to be able to be here and talk to you guys after so many years of sort of this mythic force. I think it's, it's important to showcase uh, the work we put in, the capabilities we bring to the table. Uh, I think there is this, you know, misconception, this veil of secrecy that's been draped over uh, our forces and our, our abilities, our deployments throughout the years. Some of it in part due to operational security reasons. But uh, at this point in time, it's no secret that we've deployed to Iraqi Kurdistan. And I think it's important for the Canadian public at written large to understand why we're here and what we're doing exactly. So this is an opportunity to, to, to really help uh, a people that are you know, defending their homes, their communities, uh, creating a safe haven for a, a humanitarian catastrophe uh, here in northern Iraq. Talk about the difference between your time in Afghanistan and that fight compared to this one. Afghanistan was a combat tour. Uh, our deployment here is not a combat tour for the Kenyan military. And the, the main difference being, if it were a combat tour, we would be the primary combatants. We'd be conducting business in a drastically different manner. Uh, our mandate here is an advise and assist. They do it through precision training. Get to safety, get to safety. Today's session is battlefield first aid, a mock mortar attack, very convincing fake injuries, 
and a crash course in how to save lives. When you're still in danger, make sure you get yourself to a safe area, right? So anytime you're, you're in that zone, you have to get out of there to prevent yourself from getting hurt and prevent anybody else from getting hurt any further. I have seen in the roughly two years we've been here, tangible metrics that suggest that the work we're doing with the Kurds is having a decisive effect on ISIL. Um, you know, there's 899 square kilometers of ground in this sector that has been regained by Kurdish forces from the time that we arrived here. Uh, that doesn't happen by accident. That's a, that's a demonstrable piece of progress that we've seen in the roughly two years we've been here, as one example. As more of Canada's special forces trickle in to help hold the front line, 10,000 kilometers away in Petawawa, Ontario, another round of elite soldiers are getting ready to head for Iraq. It's not easy. Um, you know, we have to have people out um, going through the Canadian forces because all our members come from the Canadian forces. Uh, they don't come off the street. They go through a very specific selection process, which is a grueling process, uh, to look at their cognitive and physical uh, attributes that we want in that person. Major General Mike Rouleau is commander of Kansoff Calm. We have a home game and we have an away game. The home game, protecting Canada and Canadians here in Canada, is always first and foremost in our mind. Now, we're not a first responder. There are tremendous police forces around this country that have that role, but there are mechanisms that can invoke the use of our national mission force should the situation require it. National mission force, that is JTF-2. It is JTF-2, and it is our chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear response unit. And this is the most secretive aspects of Special Forces Command because their core mandate relates to domestic counterterrorism. More so, it would be related to the worst case scenario should it ever happen. They are highly trained to be ready at any moment. That includes hours deploying by helicopter to allow precision assaults. I don't want people to think that every time we go somewhere, we're shooting our weapons. In fact, a large measure of what Canada's special forces are asked to do around the world doesn't involve uh, gunfire, uh, firing mortars. It is sending smart people into complex areas to be able to provide ground truth, as we call it, or information back so senior leadership can make better informed decisions. The unit, now 10 years old, is rethinking the secrecy that's long been its trademark. The dark ops side, we still may never know. But this is as close as it gets for Canadians to connect with the pointiest end of our military spear. This will be a live fire exercise using real ammunition and the real risk of injury. So we're moving on to operations for the last 24 and the next 24. It all starts with a commander's briefing, where success lies even in the smallest details. Currently, we're moving forward with the Op Hurricane 2 target intelligence uh, package and the CPG that you issued as well. The plan, an attack on an enemy hidden in a small village. First, reconnaissance. A team of snipers check it out and make sure no civilians are at risk. Next, machine gun fire mounted on Humvees pins down the enemy. Then in come the helicopters, a precision drop. A door-to-door -door search. In this exercise, when the enemy fires back, they face machine gun fire and anti-tank weapons. Reload. Reload. Hey. Enemy neutralized. A smoke screen hides the special forces as they withdraw. I want you to reiterate the, the precision of the training that unfolds here. We've got some value propositions in Special Forces Command. We think one of them is our agility, our ability to move very quickly. The other one is precision. And precision isn't just what comes out the end of a gun barrel. It's precision in the way we communicate, precision in the messaging that we put out there, in the way we support our force, precision in the way that we look after our ill and injured. So it's part of our character. This exercise is also a kind of graduation ceremony. Within days, this class will become fully qualified operators in Canada's special forces. Expose the chest, take a look. For some, that will mean deployment here to northern Iraq to train and mentor the Kurdish army, the Peshmerga, 
in the fight against ISIS. Did the CF-18s come up? Chief of Defense Staff General Jonathan Vance on his first trip as Canada's top soldier. A rare and risky visit to the front lines. This is an organization that uh, I, I want Canadians to be proud of. Uh, I think they should be proud of them. They're wonderful people, uh, you know, bright, motivated, uh, and exceptionally well trained. And we're, we're one of uh, a very, very small number of nations in the world that can do what we do. So now you're you're tripling the force special operations forces that will be here. Explain how that expanded mission is going to look. Uh, one is an expansion of the terrain uh, that we'll be on, so we'll be with more Peshmerga, more sectors along uh, the line, and then also adding to our intelligence uh, capabilities. The government refuses to call it combat, but the danger level here can change in a heartbeat. A risk special forces are trained to take on against the unpredictable and unrelenting ISIS threat. Here, only a kilometer away, across this no man's land. I would urge the Canadian public to remember that we volunteer for this, we ask for it, and we have to do it. The Kurds have asked for our assistance. The Kurds are fighting on behalf of everyone else out there, even though the conflict is now within their boundaries. And it is our responsibility to assist in mitigating that risk. If we fail to do so and they lose this fight, this fight is going to come and face us at home.